Open Gangnam Style. Dude, I'm probably going to get shot in the mouth for this at some point, but, you know, seriously. The more I think about it, the more I'm thinking that Falling in Reverse and other bands like them are actually... I think that Falling in Reverse specifically is being inspired by Gangnam Style, PSI, in a lot of ways. And I think we're going to see this potentially be happening more and more frequently. And you may say, how in the world is Psy inspiring a band that's doing stuff like this? And you may say, how in the world can the pop artist that I played at the very beginning, the Korean pop artist that I played at the very beginning, be inspiring a band that's doing that? And it comes back to how they're actually selling their product right now. Now understand, when I start talking about sales and other things of that nature, some of you guys out there that are on your more immature side or your more purist side might start going, well, they're just about to say that. They're just a second. They're about to say that. Yeah, okay, we can, we, can, we can play that game and be purists. But at the end of the day, for something to continue being worth someone's effort, it has to be a profitable venture, at least to a certain extent. A band has to be able to survive financially in order to continue doing what they do. If they can't survive financially, guess what they do? They disband. If a band is not able to make a living at doing something, they don't do it. Uh, when arts fail, it's not so much because the art itself is a failure. It's simply because somebody can't make a living doing it. And so that's what's important to understand. And over the past 20 years, we've seen a huge shift in the way the recording industry works. Right? We've seen a huge shift in how recording as a whole, artistry as a whole, all of that has shifted drastically over the last 20 years. 20 years ago, we're at the peak uh, or at the beginning of the decline of, al of physical album sales. And it used to be at that point in time that your profit ventures as a band, you had three main streams of profit, right? You had your actual music which was probably about 80 about 60 to 60 percent is probably about what I would say most of those mainstream in the media bands were doing as far as their actual revenue goes about 60 percent was the actual music themselves for both the band and the record label then you had the live shows which probably accounted for about 20 percent and the last 20 percent I would say is merchandise and so you had those three streams of revenue that really were important and obviously, the music also encompasses, you know, radio airplay, album sales, features in soundtracks and video games, which are huge parts of the component as well. However, over the years, a lot of that has changed. Uh, we still see the features on radio, the features on television and or video games and soundtracks being a very major component of it. However, album sales have pretty much evaporated. And I think you guys might know where I'm going with this. So what happened with Psy? What did Psy do in 2013? What did he do when he released the Gangnam Style? When he told the world about how to opa Gangnam Style, when he started doing this, when he started doing all of this balagna, you know, what was it that he did? What did he do in that moment to really teach us something about what, what can happen with music? He never actually released an album alongside that. Okay, they may have later on, but he didn't release, he did not release a music, a, a, an album. That song was a standalone song. And then he did two more standalone songs behind it about four, three, four, five months later. He did, he did of course, the uh, Gentleman's Song, which was still an international pop hit. And then he did his final international pop hit of that kind of trilogy of hits that he had, which, uh, which was Hangover with, uh, with, with Snoop Dogg, which I was like, wow, how'd he get Snoop Dogg in this? But then, then again, I think about it, and I'm like, Snoop Dogg is just like, sure, I'll do it. I'll, I'll wake up tomorrow and do this. Let's go. So not exactly the hardest get to get, I guess you could say. 
The point is, though, is that he did this boom, 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 where he focused not on touring, at least in the in, in the in the media see. He didn't focus on building 13 tracks, nine of them he knew were worthless or not going to get much attention or not be usable. He focused on making hits. And this is really important to think about going forward. Obviously, a band has to have uh, something of a discography, something they can play at least a full concert show of 13 songs if need be. However, falling in reverse, they're at the peak of what I would... They're at about what I would call the peak of the the rock, the true rock and metal world right now. You have to say true rock because if you look on Billboard, they'll put things like Hotsie's gay ass up there at the very top, and you're just like, that's not rock. Nothing about that is rock. Nothing about that is rock. Nothing about this is rock. And, and they'll put Hotsie up there. They'll put other things up there that you're like, this is not rock. This is not metal. Nothing about this is hard. Uh, and anyway. We're not going to get into that conversation. I just hate how, how things get classified that way when they're not. But anyway, when you look at the rock metal world, obviously for it to continue, there has to be a level of profitability around it. And we see it being very important. For instance, I've seen 311 cancel shows recently internationally because they just say, hey, we, we this is not affordable for us. So this is not, uh, and they've literally said that actually on there was one show, I think it was in like somewhere over in Europe where they had to cancel and they just said, hey guys, listen, the way this is working, it's not going to be financially doable for us, which is basically a way of saying, hey, we haven't sold enough tickets or we have, or we just look at the, over the expenses and it's just not going to work out. So again, for a band to continue operating and doing things, a band is a, is a business, okay? A band at the end of the day is a business and it has to be able to be profitable. Falling in reverse is at the peak of, of that right now in, 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 the, in the metal and rock world. Call them whatever you want to call them. I know they're hard to really dissect, but they're at the peak of that level right now as far as mainstream audience goes, as far as getting both the current pop attention, and I hate saying it like that, while at the same time incorporating us long-term hard rock fans. But they haven't released a studio album in a long, long time. You say, how can they be at the very peak? That's like saying that Metallica is still at the peak. And in a lot of ways, Metallica still is at the peak, simply because it's hard to dethrone somebody who has a back catalog and still releases some halfway decent music here or there. But you get what I'm saying. So Falling in Reverse, around the time of COVID, changed up their style as far as how they do things. And they started doing kind of exactly what Gangnam Style did, what PSI, I keep calling them style, but you know, you know who I'm talking about. They started focusing on releasing individual tracks. And if you look at this, if you look at their history over the last few years, they have again, they haven't released any albums, but they started releasing these individual tracks. And yes, they keep saying, oh, we have a new album coming out end of August. They, and that's what they're saying right now. They say they have the, the album Popular Monster coming out end of August. And it's funny that they can call it that because if you look at it, they've actually already released the majority of the album. And you say, well, how can they release the majority of the album, Jake? Look down here at their singles. Starting in 2019, they've already been releasing singles that have been going toward this particular album. So they've already released everything they're going to release off the album. They maybe have one more song hidden away. But if you look at it, one single... Uh, then you have uh, two single, three, four, five, six, seven. That's seven tracks. Seven tracks, understand. A normal album for a band is going to be somewhere between 10 and 18 tracks. Um, if you're someone like Weekend, you might do 19 to 25 because you're Weekend and you just don't care. And Weekend, weekend by the way, literally is Prince. If you don't... If you want to argue this all you want, I mean, obviously a month and a half ago we heard everyone talking, we heard Kendrick and Drake saying, I'm Mike Jack, you're Prince, and I'm like, nah, neither of you guys are either of those two. I'm sorry, Michael Jackson is Bruno Mars, and Weekend is, is Prince. Just saying it. Michael Jackson is Bruno Mars, and Weekend is Prince. Alrighty. But you get the idea. So, going back to 2019... Falling in Reverse has released seven singles already that are attributed to this album. And they've released also three more songs 
right here, this drug in me reimagined, the drug in me is reimagined, carry on, and I'm not a vampire re revamped. And they mark these, of course, as non-album singles. But you look at this, you know, they, again, they haven't released an album since 2017, and they've been releasing individual tracks all the way since 2018. So the more you look at it, and, and obviously you look at it, they really never had any chart success, which charts don't mean, don't mean jack poop. They don't, but they can be an indicator of what is gaining traction as far as listening and radio play goes. So it is important to pay attention to it, but it's not really important for anything serious. They released Popular Monster in 2019. They finally get a platinum track, goes double platinum in the U.S. as a track, and then boom, they just release individual singles, individual singles, individual singles, all of which are gaining traction. And again, for them to gain traction as the kind of band that they are, and again, tr uh, charts don't mean that much because they'll put literal pop songs on the rock charts at Billboard. Literal pop songs by actual pop artists. They'll put, they'll put Beyonce at the top of the country charts because they just don't care. They are a dying thing. They are just trying their best to stay afloat as a business. So you can't really trust them. You got to look at things like Spotify numbers, YouTube numbers, uh, other streaming platform uh, service numbers to kind of have a better idea of things. But their style for the past five years now has been to produce individual tracks with the idea of making individual songs as, as best they possibly can. And that's been their game, their, their game for the past few years. And I'm wondering if this will catch on and start happening elsewhere with other rock artists. Will we see people, bands going away from the album perspective? Because it's so difficult to real. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to make 12 to 13 to 14 tracks that are, are good. Are, that are legitimately good. It is difficult to do. So often, especially for veteran bands. Now, early, early in a band's career... Because, of course, they're, they're still experimenting, they're figuring things out, and they usually have about seven to eight years of songwriting for that one album. That's the thing they don't talk about very often, is that that first album for a band, those first two albums for a band, they have seven to eight years of being a band, usually, sometimes, where they've been writing songs but haven't released anything, or have worked on demos and have gotten those demos polished to become songs now. But later in a band's career, it's so difficult to, to make in the span of a six-month period or a four-month recording session 12 to 13 songs that are actually decent. And so when a band does that, that's a veteran band, it's impressive. When we see Judas Priest still releasing albums and they're decent, and I hate saying the word decent because it just says bleh, but you know what I'm saying. It speaks. So here's the question. Will we see more bands adopting this style? Obviously, it's got to be a whole lot more better on the budget to go into the studio and bang out one track that they've worked on and, and, and smell it as a hit and find the impetus for it than it is to try to slam together 15 tracks in a two-month, three-month period. They could probably get in there and get out of there in about, in about 72 hours save everybody a whole bunch of money on studio costs, save a whole bunch of money on just, well, everything. So here comes the question that I want to ask you is, do we see more artists start adopting this philosophy of singles, of working on singles, even in the hard rock, heavy metal community? And will this increase the quality overall of music or will it decrease it and degrade it to the point where we can't even recognize it? Obviously, I think bands like Tool will always do what Tool does, so long as they're making albums. And the bands like Tool, for instance, Sone, um, and then of course uh, Chevelle, Catatonia, those kind of bands that they just they're, they're there doing their own thing regardless. But as we see the music world shift, and we see a lot of the old guard guys dying off, retiring, permanently retiring, um, what do you think will happen? where we see less and less full albums and more and more single releases. Let me know.